let me introduce Rao, the man who does not need any introduction. Um, uh, Rao obtained his PhD degree in computer science from the University of Maryland, College Park. After a brief postdoc at Stanford, Rao joined as a faculty in uh, the computer science department at Arizona State, becoming a half professor in 96 and a full professor in 2000. And he's still expecting to, be, uh, to become two professors soon. Uh, Rao directs the Johan uh, Research Group, which is associated with the AI lab at uh, ASU. His current research agenda revolves mainly around human-aware AI systems. He is the recipient of many prestigious awards, including, uh, including an NSF Research in, uh, Initiation Award, NSF Young Investigator Award, College of Engineering Teaching Excellence Award, an IBM Faculty Award, and multiple four Google Research Awards. Among many other recognitions, uh, he was named a Fellow of AAAI in 2004 and elected a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science uh, in 2017. He has been an invited speaker at multiple uh, conferences starting way back in uh, AAAI 96, HKI ICAPS, and building up to today uh, to PRL uh, workshop. Uh, which all of these uh, uh, instantiations of that workshop he participated in so far. So with, uh, without further ado, uh, we're really happy to have you here and look, uh, looking forward to listening to your talk. And I hope I didn't miss, the, uh, miss any awards, probably mm -hmm. did. Okay, uh, so can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, um, so as as um, as Michael said, uh, I did attend all of the PRL workshops. Um, so I have some idea of what you guys have been discussing in the past several years. And uh, in general, it's always a little intimidating to speak at ICAPS because you guys know what I'm talking about. You know, half and times invited talks work because the, at, the attendees don't know what you're talking about. Uh, but so be it, I am going to try and hoodwink you today. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about planning to advise and explain um, reinforcement learning RL. Uh, let's see if I can get this, yeah. Um, so <laughs> you guys have been talking a lot about the bridge, right? So the planning RL and you want to build a bridge. Um, and you know, building this bridge is kind of tricky these days because you know we seem to be having RL and we meeting obliviousness of planning all around. Um, so you have NASA and uh, Schlumberger and various other people who actually have any kind of sequential decision-making problems using planning and OR techniques. Um, and so they don't seem to be using deep reinforcement learning techniques, thankfully yet, um, and yet, uh, we are a lot more impressed by um, these guys essentially walking on the um, on, on the tessellated grids, are uh, you know essentially learning how to walk and so on and so forth. Both are important, I guess, but um, it tended to be the case that the planning has looked at you know the applications on the right hand side and the RL you know uh, AlphaGo notwithstanding has mostly looked at. Uh, the applications on the kind of left-hand side, as you saw, for example, in Sergey Levine's uh, talk. Um, so you guys want to build a bridge. And so the question, of course, is how do we build that bridge? Um, and and I, I've sort of, you know, I, uh, pardon me for actually copying a whole bunch of tweets all through the talk. Um, I keep thinking about this planning RL dichotomy, which doesn't make any sense at some level, because, you know, I think Bernard uh, said, uh, um, England and UK and US are two great countries separated by the same language. Uh, and similarly, I think planning and reinforcement learning are sort of two central areas of AI separated essentially by a common problem. And yet there is enough of differences in the terminologies that a whole bunch of people basically miss you know, the important differences and wind up uh, trying to reinvent um, uh, the wheel. Um, so I, 
even though my main talk is going to be about the specific pieces of work that we have done and published recently on advisable and explainable reinforcement learning um, using symbolic planning techniques, uh, which is the second part, do allow me to in, uh, do indulge me to teach a little um, about planning versus RL, uh, sort of a, from a model-based perspective, because, you know, as I said, I did come to this workshop, you know, pretty much the last couple of years, as well as parts of it today, I was just too busy uh, trying to complete my talk. Um, but I do think that there tend to be some unnecessary confusions, and it might be worth just getting them um, settled once and for all before we start, so that things will be easier to, you know, uh, talk about earlier, later on. Um, so, I mean, of course, as soon as people talk about planning versus RL, people tend to think in terms of model-free versus model-based, and I'll tell you that that's really not the only important dimension, I didn't, and from the ICAP's perspective, that's not even the most important dimension of, uh, import, uh, of uh, difference. Um, so let's get started. Uh, planning versus RL, the atomic story, um, basically, you know, if you think in terms of the atomic uh, state spaces and so on, obviously you guys have seen this, some of you are aware of it, some are probably, you know, kind of may or may not be, you know, completely aware of this, but essentially planning goes from a model of the dynamics and the initial state and goal state and tries to compute the policy. Um, and RL tries to go directly from the agent's experience in the real world to try to compute the policy. So if you see, look at that uh, circle, the uh, circular diagram from Sutton's book earlier, uh, no, from, from God knows how long back, um, essentially the RL just tries to go from experience to value policy and uh, the planning part is like an intermediate step, which has some advantages in some cases, essentially. And so from the experience, you can learn the model and use that to do planning. In particular, model-based RL allows the agent to do mental simulation, whereas uh, model-free RL basically just does it like that uh, Nike commercial. So upfront, all the training has been done and so the policy just basically looks at the state and does the action. Um, so there's very little online computation, which actually is kind of interesting because you know from the from the perspective of planning, you know old old times back, there used to be this idea called universal planning, which was considered a universally bad idea. And universal planning is essentially a kind of model-free policy learning, a model-free policy um, on steroids, essentially. Um, although pure RL is supposed to learn from direct experience. Uh, in non-ergodic real world domains where you might actually die, you might actually get stuck and so on and so forth. RL techniques have also been applied to known but intractable models represented sometimes by actual symbolic models and sometimes by simulators. And in this actually, this subclass, we need to keep in mind carefully because in this subclass, RL is really a weak and lazy method. Uh, if you are doing well with RL in these classes, it's not because RL is good, but because you could not think of better heuristics using uh, the model. So you should really be able to do much better in the case of known models um, uh, that are intractable. Um, and we will talk about, as I said, it's, you know, saying that RL is a weak and lazy method is not an insult. It works all over the place. But when you have a lot more knowledge, using weak method is essentially quite ineffective and inefficient. Okay, there's a whole bunch of, uh, uh, you know, uh, glossary we can talk about. I basically uh, want to just remind people that, of course, plan and policy are the same on both sides. By planning, in planning terminology, we tend to think of a domain model. They tend to think, of, in, in RL, you tend to think of transition model. It can also be provided through a simulator. Although in planning also, there's been work that used simulators separately. Uh, when I say planning without any qualification, I mean ICAPS planning of the kind that the majority of the people do in, in this conference. Um, so goals, rewards, goals, trajectory constraints, preferences, everything else goes under the guise of reward metric. So essentially all of those just get compiled down to reward metric. And so saying reward is all you need is sort of like saying Turing machine is all you need Yes, but so what? I mean, really, you may want to provide a lot more expressive language to represent what it is that you want from your decision maker. Um, and then one other thing that people sometimes get confused about is, you know, heuristics in planning, essentially, 
can be thought of in terms of reward shaping in RL. You add like a little reward to the real reward and you want to still hope that the policy is optimal. That's like basically saying, if you add the admissible heuristic, your final policy will still be optimal. This is something that's worth keeping in mind. Um, people keep tend to think of uh, model based versus model free as like the main difference. In fact, I just read a paper where they actually said in the very front uh, page that that's like a main difference. Um, uh, but really, yes, planning uses models while RL can obviously get away without models, you know, by, by being model free. And yes, uh, models are a way for RL to amortize the cost of learning about its environment. So you actually provide the model, then you essentially can avoid relearning the transition dynamics, for example, every time you work in that environment. Okay. And if, yeah, so this is something that planning people know already. You know, we actually start with a domain model and we don't keep trying to ask every time, what did you say this blocks world is? Because you just have the domain model. Um, but the models in planning, AI planning, actually they differ from the models used in RL in a more important respect, which actually is relevant to things that I talk about here. Uh, models learned in RL um, may or may not be interpretable, um, they may be internal dynamic models, such as the things that go from one pixel state to another pixel state using some latent features, which you, the user of the, the decision um, support system have no, no idea at all. Um, so in those cases, uh, essentially models may reduce sample complexity, but they certainly don't allow for interpretability. Whereas human given models, which I think our you know, community tends to spend a lot more time about, they can provide the declarative biases for RL, they can actually provide interpretability out of the box, but they have their own disadvantages as you know. As you know. Um, so to come back to this planning versus RL, I want now actually talk about AI planning versus deep RL. When people talk about RL these days, mostly they think in terms of deep RL. Uh, and when we talk about planning in this group, we talk about AI planning, quote unquote, I hate the term, but that's sort of become the standard. Um, in the non-atomic case, we do need to talk about representation of states. And when you talk about representation, you have to ask whose representation are you talking about? In this case, AI planning focused on explicit knowledge tasks, and it basically starts with human given domain models. And so representations are ipso facto, that is from by, by, as given interpretable at some level to the humans. Whereas in the case of RL systems, for explicit knowledge systems, there is a choice. RL can either use partial models seeded by the humans, uh, human PDL sorts of models and, and improve them, or they just you know, decide to learn their representations from scratch. When you know, many of the people are doing pixel dynamics models, for example, for the blocks world, they're saying, screw your model. I'm going to learn whatever I want to learn about this domain myself directly from scratch. Um, for tacit, now, so there is this choice, and of course the, the trade-off in the choice is that the first one is more interpretable, but in fact, there's this worry that the model that the humans, representations that humans give are not good enough and you could provide improved performance if you learn your own representations. Um, and then um, if you learn the uh, representations from last sensory data, then they can be quite uninterpretable. There's no real reason why internal models learned by a deep reinforcement learning system or any deep learning system should be uh, interpretable to the humans. You have to actually do this extra step of making them interpretable if you care about that, which I actually do. Um, for tacit knowledge tasks, they basically have to learn their own representations because humans are not ready to give anything. So for people in RL, who tend to mostly work on tacit knowledge tasks. And I think Sergey was actually, you know, many of the earlier parts of Sergey's talk this morning, for example, in robotics and manipulation, et cetera, they tend to be about tacit knowledge tasks where you don't really know how you walk. You don't know how exactly what left, what angles and parts you have to put at the 20 different you know, uh, joints you have so that you don't fall down. And so in that case, you might as well let the system learn. Uh, and you're not going to ask the system ever, why exactly did you put the joint number 17 at 23.7 degrees angle as again as 29 degrees angle? You're just not going to bother about that. You only care about probably other kinds of interpretability, such as why did you break this ways? Um, so to complicate matters further, you know, as nice as this explicit versus tacit knowledge distinction is, the complicated matters further, most real world tasks are actually hybrid with aspects of the explicit knowledge 
um, and the top levels and, and, and tacit knowledge at the bottom levels. And this sort of also became clearer as you can see in, in, in many motion planning, task planning uh, combinations, including uh, this morning's talk. Um, okay, um, so I don't have to belabor this. Planning people always believed in doctrine. They believed in symbolic models. They, we have you no know, actual languages for talking about the, the, the domain models, domain knowledge that we're going to give to our planners. Explicit knowledge in planning actually in the past used to be more of the thing that I would argue against that basically back in you know, ICAPS 2003, I basically was haranguing people saying, you can't possibly be asking for so much domain knowledge that there's no planning left to be done. And so, you know, there are certain kinds of HTN planners, for example, that were asking not just the domain dynamics, but also search control knowledge to be embedded in the domain model. And, you know, if it's not easily available to the humans, you know, forcing them to give it seems to be a kind of a silly idea. But then, as you know, lately we have gone, the, the pendulum has swung and we are actually more interested in not using any kind of a knowledge and trying to get it from scratch ourselves. Um, I did talk about this at length in, uh, you know, I think in 2020 in the DC um, doctoral consortium um, uh, called Polanyi versus planning, where I mentioned the fact that tacit versus explicit knowledge and the fact that AI planning techniques tend to focus on explicit knowledge more of the time. And that just as it's kind of silly to force humans to give knowledge that they don't have access to, that you should really be spending time doing search yourself. It's also kind of silly to spurn humans who are ready to give you knowledge about their domain saying, no, 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 we're going to just learn it from humongous amounts of uh, experience data um, from simulators in particular. By the way, actually most of these RL systems don't really work in the real world. As you all know, um, they tend to depend on the um, uh, simulators. And the problem of course is simulator is a kind of a black box model of the real world uh, that has been provided to you so that if you die in the simulator, you don't actually die. You can restart your life all over again. If you die in the real world, like that car is about to, it's dead. It's basically only the other people surrounding it can learn what screw up it did. Um, so it's highly unlikely that for explicit knowledge domains, simulators are actually easier to provide than partial domain knowledge. And uh, so insisting that on simulators, just so you can't be accused of any human given knowledge is a bit perverse in my view, because I think sometimes writing the simulator actually might take longer time than providing the model at a partial level of abstraction. I, this is an interesting connection that some of you might actually enjoy. I won't go into too much detail, but if you are actually provided the simulator, uh, versus, if you're thinking of simulator versus model, when you have the model or the simulator for the domain, that means it's actually the system is not working in the real world. It's working either off of a, um, symbolic model or a simulator, then the difference between planning versus reinforcement learning in that case really becomes a difference between SAT and CSP. You know, SAT basically looks at declarative clauses and CSP says, give me any piece of code that can take a partial assignment and tells me whether or not that partial assignment is still consistent. And so it turns out that there are some advantages for you know, CSP models, there are some advantages for SAT models, but neither of them are at a definite win. And uh, neither, of them are a, uh, neither, neither of them are a definite win. Um, so similarly, um, so th that's something that I want you to keep in mind that in fact, when the model is known, you know, RL really is a weak method and you may not necessarily want to say that RL will do better than any planning approaches. This should not be surprising. I think last year, some of you may have remembered that there was this four paradigm folks who ran uh, a, a competition for scheduling tasks, um, which is really a classical OR planning ish problem. And they were hoping that some RL methods will be provided uh, for this uh, situation, for this particular problem. And then they found to their consternation that the winning entries essentially did not use RL. And so they were actually, towards the end, they were saying, we should make the next iteration be more friendly to RL. That seems kind of silly to miss the point of important differences between RL and, and, um, um, and, 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 and planning. Um, so coming back to that LUC bridge, on the case of, in the case of AI planning, it's been used mostly for explicit knowledge tasks where the humans provide flexible interpretable models and the system searches for the best policy within them. Um, 
And given that the models are human, given policies are more or less interpretable, although of course, you know, there's a lot of, you know, just because something, just because you can make sense of the symbol doesn't necessarily mean you can understand the combinatorics and you still have to provide certain levels of explanation, but you're starting from a much more shared vocabulary standpoint. Um, on the case of reinforcement learning, essentially model-based reinforcement learning assumes that it can learn the model from experience. And these models may either be seeded with partial models representations provided by the humans, in which case they will be somewhat more interpretable or learned from scratch, in which case they may have better performance. In fact, if the humans don't understand the domain completely, their representations might be hobbling the solver. Whereas if the solver learns things from massive data, it can actually find insights that the humans have not been able to capture. Um, so that is like the first part. And then the second part that I want to talk about is basically given that uh, I have this planning is about explicit knowledge tasks and the, you know RL is much better for tacit knowledge tasks and learned model by itself. So the question is either I can force RL to use knowledge based models that uh, the, the, the humans have provided, or we can say, you do whatever you want, but you should be able to take advice from me and provide explanations to me at the same level of ease that normal symbolic planners do. Okay, so that's the stance that we take. So making RL advisable and explainable, even with its own inscrutable models is what I'm going to focus on. Uh, sometimes actually learning inscrutable models when the freely, a model is freely available is a dumb idea as I pointed it out to you. But I'll assume that you chose to do that, and I still want your your decisions to be making sense to me. And so you need to take the responsibility of taking advice from me about my preferences and providing um, providing explanations if I need. Uh, so I think I, I'm not being particularly I'm not being particularly controversial if I were to say uh, that I want AI systems to be explainable and advisable. We are increasingly surrounded by these systems and we want at least the decisions they're making to be understandable. And oftentimes there are preferences that humans have that may not actually be explicitly known to the system upfront. And so you should be able to advise the system at least about your preferences and you should be able to understand its decisions. And so for alignment case, for concordance with our preferences, as well as sometimes efficiency, I might tell you things, tell the system things that might make the plan more efficient or the search for the plan or the policy more efficient. Um, the explainability and this advisability, when you are interested in that, they should be on our, that is human terms. We shouldn't have to debug AI systems to interpret them. It should be a pity if in fact, all the progress in AI results in us humans going into the incomprehensible land of or some deep reinforcement learning system and trying to figure out what the heck it is doing. That won't be not, that, that would not be, that would be much worse than the early mixed initiative planning where humans would go into the search queue of symbolic planners and try to rearrange the search queue. That's kind of very sad too. That's a bad way to live life. Uh, so we argue that basically systems should support a symbolic lingua franca and for a decision support systems, this lingua franca has to be um, you know, basically in terms of symbolic planning. That's my main takeaway for this second part. And I'll show you some examples of the work that we have done that actually uses that. Um, I do want to mention that the moment you say symbolic as well as a system that is possibly using, you know, neural networks as, uh, you know, as a deep reinforcement learning system, uh, there's this issue of neural symbolic AI. And I kind of want you to distinguish in your mind between two different motivations for neuro symbolic approaches. One is internal symbolic reasoning. That means even if there is no humans in the loop anywhere, the system might want to come up with abstractions of the representation it has learned just to improve its performance. That might be possible, but you know, if it basically is finding symbolic abstractions of the representations it has learned, those symbols don't have to have anything connected to the symbols that the humans actually think in terms of. So there's no real reason why, as, as uh, Wittgenstein said, if a lion were to speak, you would be able to understand because there really is no shared vocabulary. There's no shared experience. Um, the other case is symbolic communication interface, which is what I'm a lot more interested in. I'm saying you can do your internal reasoning any which way you want, but I, the human, should be able to 
give you advice in terms of preconditions and effects and which action to do when in terms of giving advice. And you should be able to give explanations to me in terms of why you did a particular action instead of a different action in terms of the missing preconditions or violated effects or something. So that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. So symbolic communication interface is what you're looking at. Um, so there's a bunch of work that we have done earlier on in terms of uh, what it takes for even a symbolic planner to provide explanations to humans in the loop. That is the thing that we have done beforehand. There's a book and a monograph out there um, for symbolic planning models. So this is where even if in fact you share symbols, even if you share symbols, you may still need to do some heavy lifting to make sure that you are providing explanations with respect to the differing symbolic models that the humans might have in mind. They might have a different you know, preconditions and effects, for example, for the same actions than what the machine thinks it is supposed to be. So this, that we have done that, I'm not going to go over that, but in, you know, for this particular talk, the more interesting part is what happens if you have vocabulary mismatch too. That means in fact, the machine is essentially not thinking in terms of any concepts that the humans are thinking about. So you need to then provide a vocabulary mapping. Um, so the lowest common denominators for humans and AI agents typically tends to be just raw signals and data. So if you are a deep reinforcement learning system looking at a pixel, you know, an image, then pixels are the common uh, you know, substrate that the humans and the machines are looking at. And not surprisingly, explainable machine learning has been thinking in terms of things like saliency regions in the pixel space. My general stance, and I've talked about this in other places, is that it's kind of, very sad to have to get by with pixel-based, saliency-based explanations. First of all, very few people ask explanations about images. They ask explanations about decisions in a sequential decision-making problem. And in the case of sequential decision-making problem, you almost have to provide a saliency region over the video of your life or the video of the entire world saying these you know, space-time signal tubes were the reasons why I had to do this particular decision. And that winds up imposing very high cognitive load on the human. So those kinds of explanations are extremely hard to give. And those kinds of advice is also extremely hard to give. You know, providing advice you know, by at the pixel space is very hard to give if you're thinking about the domain in, um, in, in, in objects and in relations between the objects. So what we've been basically, as I said, pointing explanations are actually pretty hard to comprehend. And you know, so there is a IIII 2022 uh, blue sky paper that just we presented. That's what I'm drawing for the rest of the talk, where we basically argue that pretty much any decision support system, any AI system, and especially decision support systems, and as far as we are concerned, sequential decision support systems, they should, irrespective of what they think, you know, what representations they make up, et cetera, they should provide a symbolic interface, a symbolic quote unquote, more than an API to the humans in the loop, such that they can provide explanations through, you know, in symbolic means and take advice in symbolic means from the humans. And that will allow for humans to actually improve the speed up or to, you know, make sure that their preferences are given to the machine in symbolic terms and also accept explanations in symbolic terms. And so that can actually provide a nice interaction, you know, cyclic interaction between humans in the loop with the machines. So that's basically the thing that we do. Um, in particular, um, I want to talk a little about accepting advice, a couple of papers and, accept, and providing explanation, one more paper and then end. Uh, so in the case of accepting advice, essentially, Irrespective of what the deep reinforcement learning system, in this particular example that I'm talking about, I'll be looking at a deep reinforcement learning system. It might well be having internal representations that don't have any connection to what humans think of about a particular domain. And so the humans might be giving advice in terms of objects and predicates and actions, and it should be able to convert that into terms that might make sense in its internal symbolic representation. So if I am basically thinking in a different language than what you guys are thinking, then I am actually producing those thoughts in that language, still converting into the language that you can understand so that we can you know, make sense to each other. So there's a, a new RIPS 2021 Spotlight paper uh, called uh, where we talked about this expand system, which looks at this human advisable reinforcement learning problem where 
when the reinforce during the reinforcement learning um, you know time frame while the system is being trained the the agent the humans can provide feedback about whether decisions are right or wrong um, either from the point of view of you know efficiency or from the point of view of safety considerations and you know you are providing that decisions and the question then is so I, when given a, like a pixel state where the system is doing the following action, the human gets to say, no, not this action, this other action. That's the first part. And more importantly, they get to say, the reason this other action is better is because, and provide an explanation as to why the advice is more relevant. And this explanation used to be in previous systems in terms of pixels, you know, by actually annotating regions of the images, we support essentially object-based um, you know, explanation. So basically you say, don't do this action because there is a stop sign, for example, don't do this action because there is a waze. And the system essentially then gets to convert that object by itself into the pixel representation. So the system does the heavy lifting of converting denotation of symbols into the pixel space. And then once it does that, it can also do other crazy things. In this paper, for example, it increases the number of examples by essentially keeping the region of that object in the pixel space constant and disturbing the rest of the pixel space so that you have more and more examples where hopefully the correct, um, uh, correct action is still the one that the human has provided. So this is sort of a context-aware data augmentation. With these sort of ideas, actually, we could show that, in fact, the system actually does much better in taking human advice. In this particular case, actually, human advice is meant to improve efficiency. So the sample complexity is uh, better. Um, it turns out that the same kind of ideas can also be used even when, in fact, the task under consideration is a tacit knowledge task. Um, by the way, I should mention that in the previous case, we were looking at um, um, Montezuma's Revenge, um, you know, which is actually both a pixel-based approach, but it also has like a symbolic representation that the humans think in terms of. So the system is thinking in terms of pixel-based representation, our internal representation, and the humans are thinking in terms of these objects and so on. Um, even in the case of things like grasping and robotic kind of um, you know, tasks, we actually showed in a paper in um, uh, Kibla 22 workshop that the, the a demonstration that a human provides can be maybe ambiguous, but you can reduce the ambiguity in the demonstration by trying to parse it in terms of the symbols and the actions that the human model might have. So that sort of reduces the amount of uh, amount of uh, ambiguity um, in, the, in the advice that the humans are providing. Um, the other type of advice that actually was just presented a couple of minutes back, I believe, in, in, uh, in PRL is essentially what if instead of doing on demand, this is the right action, this is the right action, I want to tell my the RL system, here is an approximate model of my domain deal with this and try to make policies you know that are kind of consistent with this and hopefully if, you know so that you can do training much faster um, so when you're doing this kind of integrating symbolic planning models into rl where essentially the planning model is kind of seeding the rl's model um, one big worry is what if the model is incorrect this is kind of the thing that people say well if the humans provide it it could be wrong yes it can be wrong but it's better to take you know, advice that is potentially incomplete and incorrect, but it's given by the humans and try to work as far as you can with it as an RL system, than to just say, I'm just going to ignore everything and start from scratch and try to look for policies myself and hope that they'll make sense to you. Um, so if in our case, basically this paper, this is actually a nice marriage of you know, ICAPS planning and RL systems. They basically, we basically use um, an incomplete, incorrect model potentially, where there's no requirement that the model be incomplete, uh, correct or complete, and, uh, and basically act as if that model is correct, extract landmarks, and assume that those landmarks and their orderings are going to be preserved by at least one plan in the real world. And so the, the, the RL system then is going to be looking for options or subplans for each of the landmarks and basically tries to come up with a diverse set of options for each of the landmarks because the minimal 
obvious plans may not actually work out because there are many details that may have been missed in the incomplete incorrect model. And so you take this diverse set of um, um, you know, options that you learned and you actually put them together using a meta controlling that can be used either by a, you know, a combinatorial search or an RL system. Um, and we actually show just like the old strips is complete for serializable domains, but when are domains serializable, it's if in fact strips can solve them. Similarly, we actually come up with a, a theorem saying uh, MVTR conditions uh, where uh, for that, that, satis that if they are satisfied, which basically requires that a, at least one plan would satisfy the landmark orderings, then that would be enough uh, for the system to be, RL system to be able to come up with a policy that is consistent with the model. Um, but then figuring out whether or not it's MVTR essentially is actually checking whether RL system has been able to find it this way. Uh, so, you know, in terms of looking for the diverse skills, the RL system learns the skills for each of the landmarks separately. And then it tries to make sure that the skills are diverse in the sense that they use different actions, presumably, um, and in coming to the same landmark so that they can be combined together into a global plan. And if we have a complete model, this is sort of like finding non-minimal plans for individual sub goals so that those sub, sub plans can be merged or serialized together to solve the overall problem. There's an old, APES 96 paper that I have that actually talks about that idea. And then here we are doing it in the context where the model is not complete. So there is actually a beautiful deeper marriage between the RL and planning ideas. Once again, we can do, we did experimental evaluation. One of the nice things about this is this idea works even if the RL is actually not using any symbolic models at all. All it needs is a kind of a classifier that tells whether or not the state satisfies a particular fluent or not. And those can be learned. That's basically how we do the symbolic interfaces. And again, experimental results show that this idea actually does better than the RL going on its own and trying to do things from scratch. And also with respect to some other computing approaches. The last thing I want to mention um, is the explanations part where essentially, if in fact, you know, the planner, the RL system comes up with a policy or an action in a particular state and, and the human is not happy with that and they might provide uh, like a you know, you know, like a, um, a foil and say, why didn't you use this action in this particular state? And again, this is the Montezuma's revenge uh, problem. Um, and, and so the idea there would be that the foil would to actually provide the explanation uh, for the foil uh, as to why the foil is not feasible. The planner learns a local symbolic PDL model. The planner actually, so the RL, the RL actually is not doing PDTL. RL is basically doing whatever the heck it wants. It, in our case, it was actually using RAM states because you know the RAM states are possible for the uh, for the Atari games. But it could have been doing deep reinforcement learning. It could have its own internal representations. But on the spot at that point, it actually generates a local symbolic approximation uh, of the model around that decision and then uses that to say, well, I can't do this because a particular precondition for this action is missing in the current state. So the explanations are still in the language that the humans can understand. And we, you know, in iClear, basically uh, this year, we presented this paper, which basically talks about how essentially how the local symbolic model is computed uh, through sampling uh, online at the time when you are actually providing the explanation. This is sort of like, you know, those of you who know XAI literature and the LIME system, LIME system provides local linear representations. Here we are doing local symbolic representations uh, around the decision. Um, we also get to actually compute the confidence level, the RL system gets to compute a confidence level for its explanation. And so that sort of, takes into account the fact that you're thinking in one representation and providing an explanation a different representation, what if you're making everything up? So these conference levels try to capture the kind of the accuracy with respect to the machine of, of its explanation. Again, in the case of empirical evaluation, the bigger thing that we focused on is, are 
humans in the loop happier with the symbolic explanations are the saliency based explanations and the results are that they tend to be happier with symbolic explanations there's a bunch of open research challenges in making this symbolic interface work including collecting the initial concept set grounding the concept set basically using classifiers and also expanding vocabulary either from the rl side saying give me more vocabulary items because my saliency region cannot be approximated by the fluence that you have provided me are telling the human new fluence which is actually the kind of thing that might happen if for example alpha go is trying to explain the reason for its uh, infamous 33rd move to the humans in the loop where you are essentially teaching new vocabulary items to humans so we actually talk about this in that uh, you know the blue sky paper about these challenges and how the um, concepts are initial concept sets are for example taken one thing that i do i think there was at least one talk earlier in the morning that kind of connects to this you don't necessarily have to generate new concept set every time you could potentially use uh, things like scene graph representations uh, and amortize and you know and slowly establish like a, a common ground vocabulary between the humans and the machines and then build on top of that so that can kind of reduce the amount of work that you do um, grounding the concept set of course is learning the denotation and as I said, vocabulary expansion is actually a more interesting thing. And I'll refer you to the paper about some of our initial ideas on that. The first and second challenges have actually been considered to some extent in making sure that uh, the explanations and the advice are taken by the systems that we have you know, uh, built. Okay, so that's the agenda that I think I have sort of rushed through. Um, and so in summary, we started with kind of a model-based comparison of planning versus RL. It's kind of a different kind of a comparison than some of you might have been used to. I hope it kind of helped uh, some of you to get in you know, a slightly different insights about the differences between RL and planning. We argued that RL system should support a kind of a symbolic interface of communication uh, with humans, irrespective of whether using, they're using hum symbolic models or not. If they're using symbolic models, well and good. Uh, if not, you better be ready to convert the representation as needed. Um, and, and then we discussed how planning, symbolic planning that we know of can play a role here. The advice can become partial symbolic models, for example. And uh, we illustrated some of the potential solutions in you know, a couple of systems that we built, black box and iClear, I expand in new rips, SGRL in ICML this year, and then that um, SF EBL, a subtle EBL, which is in, um, uh, which is in the, um, um, triple AI workshop um, uh, on RL and games. Um, and of course, you know, there's all sorts of interesting philosophical questions that you can get into, such as if you actually develop a symbolic interface to talk to humans, would you eventually start doing your reasoning also in that interface as again as having two different lives? I won't talk about that right now, but I will stop here. And if there's any time, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. We have time for questions. Please raise your hands. <laughs>